Right Behind You by Gail Jowles, Part 1, Alaska. Chapter 1, What I Know On the afternoon of his seventh birthday, I set Bobby Clark on fire. I was nine. It was all about Bobby's birthday present, a baseball club. <clears throat> Chapter 2, What I Think I Remember it surprises people to learn that summer days can get highs of 100 degrees in the Alaskan interior, and July is fire season. But it was a windless day, so Dad was planning a controlled burn near our cabin to clear the brush. He had let it get out of hand while Mom was sick. A lot of things had gotten out of hand while Mom was sick. Me, Dad, Aunt Gemma. We were miles from any real town or even a road that was more than a rutted dirt trail. Dad was draining all the gas out of the lawnmower into a small pail. Why can't we just go get some gas? Stop whining, Kip. There's no wind this morning. It takes a good hour to get to the gas station. If the wind kicks up while we're going to town, we can't get the burn done. We can make do. Dad handed me the pail. Take this and pour it into the bucket outside. Don't get it on any of your clothes. Be quick about it. I still have to drain the snow machine and the generator. <clears throat> How stupid was it to make a hot day hotter by tending a fire? I was sick of working hard all the time, and I was tired of making do the Alaskan way. Being poor, following Dad's orders, I gave the lawnmower a toe-bruising kick. Dad laughed. You get mad at me, you kick the tire. I don't get a bruise and the tire doesn't care, and you're the only one hurting. How's that working for you, Kip? As I worked the last pail of gasoline into the bucket, Dad came, out, Dad came out of the shed. I don't want to fight with you all day, Kip. Lose the attitude. My head hurts. Your head always hurts whenever there's work to be done. Dad snapped into his I will be obeyed voice. You have to get tough to live in the bush. It's not called the last frontier. I tuned him out. I'd heard the same lecture on, a hard, on hard work a million times. I was about ready to throw the gasoline on the house so we wouldn't have to live in the bush anymore. He stopped his sermon when we heard a car and then saw the dust swirl on our excuse for a road. I think it's Aunt Gemma, I said. Dad's face went so tight I could see lumps where his jaw was. And she's here for another fuss, Dad said. The woman won't leave me alone. Aunt Gemma's rental car bucked to a stop in front of our cabin. She got out and slammed the door, rounded the back, opened the trunk, and pulled out boxes. What the hell does she think she's doing now? Dad was kind of whispering to himself, and he sounded like he could throw Aunt Gemma and her car right down our road. Stay out here and straighten up the shed for me, Kip. He slapped his lighter on the hood of our truck and headed toward Aunt Gemma. They were already arguing before they hit the porch, about me again. My mother died in April, and Aunt Gemma had been hammering Dad at Dad, hammering at Dad since then to let her take me back to civilization. As much as I was sick of the Alaskan way, I wasn't sure if I was sick of Alaska, and Aunt Jenna's civilization, civilization preached nothing but rules to me. It meant leaving the place where I had memories of Mom. It meant leaving Dad, which I couldn't even imagine, even if he did make me mad. Aunt Gemma and Dad's arguing made my head hurt. It reminded me of the other arguing, Mom and Dad's. I always thought that was my fault, too. I could hear their voices, like hail on our cabin's tin roof, louder faster, harder. Pig-headed, my son, lawyer, over my dead body. She died because she didn't get decent medical care in this. The hollow inside me filled up with red mean. I banged the snow shovel against the wall with the shed to drown out the storming with mine. But the yelling from the house let the words pop between the beats of metal against wood. And then Bobby Clark trotted up to the doors of the shed. Kip, you here? Come out. I want to show you something. I got work to do. My dad says to clean up the shed. Go home. Come out to see my birthday present. It's the best baseball glove anybody ever had. I stepped out of the shed to send the little snot on his way. Bobby was waving his glove in front of my face. My dad gave me a bike, but I don't know how to ride a two-wheeler yet. This is from my mom. She said it would make me the best player on the t-ball team. The glove was a beauty. 
The leather was the color of leaves when they first dropped to the ground, and it was on Bobby Clark's hand. Nothing can make you a good baseball player, I said. You can't catch a ball, not even if you had a glove twice that size. You're just mad because you're too poor to have a glove. He waved the glove again, taunting me with it. You don't even have a mom to give you one. He pushed it toward me then jerked it away. I glared at the birthday gift from his mother. My head throbbed and as the voices in the house rose. Bobby shoved the glove toward my face again. I wanted to ruin it. Ruin the glove. The birthday glove. I grabbed the bucket. I sloshed the gasoline on the glove. It splashed all over his arms and his shirt and dribbled down his pants. Some even spattered up on his face. I don't think he knew what I threw on him. He sputtered when he called me a bad name, and I pulled his hand out of the glove. He, cradles it, he cradled it against his chest. By then I had the lighter. I had flipped it open, and I had flipped, away, flipped the wheel. As soon as I saw the blue spurt of flame, I pitched it at the birthday baseball glove. Pitched it onto Bobby Clark.